Hello, uh, welcome everyone to another training webinar of Open Air. Today it's the fifth version of our Horizon Europe Open Science Requirements in, uh, in Practice webinar. And before we start, I would like to quickly go over some housekeeping notes with you. Okay, so uh, as you might have noticed, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording uh, shortly afterwards. In order to ask questions or uh, share your thoughts or comments, you can use the Zoom uh, Q&A section. You can also use the same section uh, in Zoom to upvote any question that you, that you would like our speaker to address first. Uh, you can also find uh, the presentations in, uh, in this link or scan the QR code available in this slide. And I will make sure to also share this link with you uh, in the chat shortly afterwards. Um, so with this very brief notes, I would like to uh, give a warm welcome and introduce our speaker for today. So today we have with, we have with us uh, Jonathan England, the training specialist uh, of Open Air, uh, that will be guiding us through the requirement, the open science requirements in Horizon Europe uh, projects and programs, and also share some tips, uh, guides, and tools and services that you can use to make sure that uh, you are compliant. Uh, so with this uh, very brief introduction, I would like to give the floor now to Jonathan so they can give their presentation. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, I think. Yeah. So. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Welcome everyone. So today, um, as you probably gathered, um, we will be talking about the Horizon Europe uh, requirements in terms of open science. And I'll also cover some of the open science parts in the uh, grant proposal. So um, the slides are already on, uploaded on, on Zenodo um, and you will find on the first slide, basically all the different resources that uh, I'm, referencing to in in the uh, in the webinar so you probably already know this but uh, i'm going to give uh, again and like um, the the definition of open science which is the approach based on open cooperative work um, and systematic sharing of knowledge and tools as early and widely as possible in the process and this covers uh, as you know open access to publication um, uh, to data management uh, it covers also this uh, concept that I will refer to in, in a second about um, open access to data as open as possible, as close as necessary. Um, but also the, the European Commission does put uh, in Horizon Europe quite a lot of emphasis on sharing information about outputs, tools, instruments um, to validate or re use the results and the data. And um, that the digital, whether it's physical or digital data, should um, the access to the results should be um, available for to um, validate the conclusions. So we'll first start with the publications, then I'll go over the, the data, and then we'll see a few more um, aspects of those uh, recommended practices, but which are not uh, required. So in terms of the mandates for open access to publications, you have to deposit the peer-reviewed manuscripts. So there's two different versions, which I'll mention in, in a second. Um, so one of those versions in a trusted repository. And again, I'm going to cover what the different types of uh, versions exist and what is a trusted repository for the European Commission. One of the big difference with if you were funded under uh, H2020 is that there's no embargo period allowed. So you have to um, make your work available in open access immediately uh, on, uh, upon publication. And you have to retain your rights. Uh, so by applying a Creative Commons license on one of the um, versions of your manuscript. And as I said, you need to add in information about uh, research outputs uh, to validate the conclusions. And also don't forget to add the acronym and code of the project within each uh, publication. So a few definitions. So when you uh, first send the draft to a publisher, it's what we call a, a preprint. 
then the peer reviewing process happens. And then when the final version is, uh, is uh, the accepted peer reviewed version uh, is what we call the author accepted manuscript. Previously, it was also known as postprint. Um, and usually this is the, the version that you, you might be uh, retaining your, your rights on. Um, but uh, after the, the publisher does all the copy editing, and then what we so what I call the the, um, the 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 pretty and ugly version of your of your manuscript. So the pretty version is the version of record. Um, and so either the author accepted manuscript or the version of record are fine as long as you put one of those in open access. You are um, you are. Um, um, the, the man you are um, uh, sorry <laughs> you are fine with the, the mandate um in terms of trusted repositories uh, there's a whole definition that the European Commission uh, gives but what we want to what I want to really focus on is basically anything that in your discipline uh, is commonly used and uh, is uh, always, um, or general purpose repository or your institutional repository will be considered as a, a trusted repository. So something as um, um, like um, the, the publisher's uh, uh, website, it wouldn't be a repository by itself. It might be available in, in open access on the publisher's website, but you still need to uh, deposit on a repository. So you can search for that on uh, OpenAI Explorer. Then there's also other websites for publication, for instance, Open Door, which allows you to, to search for specific uh, repositories. There are a few things I want to mention about the mandate around open access. Um, first of all, the publication fees, so usually called article processing charges or book processing charges for, for books, are reimbursable if uh, the the um, the journal the, the the publishing venue is in full open access. If it's a hybrid uh, journal where you know it's a um, subscription based journal that allows uh, um, authors to publish in open access, uh, then you you are allowed because there are no restrictions on which you publish. Um, but uh, the APCs wouldn't you wouldn't be able to. Um, uh, cover them under the, the grant. In terms of the license, um, the, if you are publishing a book or a monograph on text format, you can apply a more restrictive license. But bear in mind that a chapter in an edited book is not considered as, um, as a long text format. So it would still be under a Creative Commons attribution license, which I will um, mention in, in, in a few seconds. So one thing that I want to really insist on and is linked to uh, the, the whole mandate is that you have to deposit um, one version of your manuscript in in a in this um, trusted repository. And so that's what we call self-archiving. So irrespectively of whether it's a, um, full open access or hybrid or wherever you, you publish, you need to deposit it also on the trusted repository, which also means that uh, the, the the author accepted manuscript and the version of record might have different licenses applied, uh, applied to it. Um, for subscription-based journals or hybrid journals, you don't always have to pay for open access. It's um, the Coalition S, um, you might have heard of it, Plan S have issued a, the rights retention strategy, which is basically a statement that want you that you it's a statement that you put um, when you're submitting your your article to the uh, to the publisher and it basically um, asserts ownership of at least the author accepted manuscript. Um, and that means that if you have authorships on that version you are um, compliant because you will be able to to upload it on, on the repository. You can check the journal's uh, eligibility um, by uh, going on general check at all, just put from the European Commission, and uh, it will let you know if if um, the, um, the journals allows you uh, for this uh, route. 
there is also another option, which is uh, Open Research Europe, which is the um, publishing platform from the, the European Commission. So I'll, um, I'll go over this a bit more into details just to, to give you a bit more insight of why the European Commission created this. So the, the first thing I want to, um, to mention is that the, it is a publishing platform. It's not a repository. So you, you go there to publish your work, not to deposit it and not self-archiving. Um, if it's open to all Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe um, beneficiaries, and it's um, free for you to use, it's an optional service, so you don't have to, to use it. You can, as I said before, you can publish wherever you, you want, um, and you can use it so you can still publish after the end of the project. It's uh, based on open peer review, meaning that uh, the name of the reviewers, the, the actual content of the reviews, um, all the revisions, uh, the versions of the revisions are openly available. And uh, you first publish basically your, your work and then the review uh, happens. So the, the work is immediately available um, even though it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. And because it's made by the European Commission, it has automatic compliance with uh, the open access requirements because it will self-archive it automatically for you on Zenodo. So the whole thing I said about self-archiving is uh, only the, the only time where you don't need to do it is for Horizon uh, for Open Research Europe. So the publishing process is um, quite uh, streamlined. Um, there is an uh, in-house editorial team that does uh, pre-publication checks um, to ensure that all the policies and, and guidelines are, are followed. Um, then the, the, the publication is, um, is deposited. It's available for others to, to read. <clears throat> and the reviewers are invited to do the review. And then once it's past review, it is archived on, on uh, Zenodo and indexed in all the different indexes. So it's multidisciplinary. There's a lot of different um, types of articles that you can submit depending on your field. <clears throat> There's, as I said, a, a lot of different uh, pre-publication checks, but the team does not review the actual content. It's only the um, guidelines, um, language, data availability, ethical approval, um, and all this. Um, the review process is um, also quite transparent. The reviewers are suggested by you as authors, um, and then they basically go ahead and do like the normal peer reviewing process, but um, in, a, in an open uh, in an open way. Um, for an article to be approved, it needs to to have. Um, at least uh, two uh, approved checks, um, and it can have up to one approved with reservations. Um, and so basically until it is fully approved, it wouldn't be considered as a past peer review, basically. Um, and this is just an example uh, for, for reference of what a report could uh, look like. Um, one thing also that is uh, interesting to, to mention is that there are some um, uh, research communities, so collection and community gateways that uh, is available on Open Research Europe that uh, that could um, uh, that you can basically uh, have a look at um, if you're interested in all the different um, papers in, in that uh, field. And yes, there's a, a newsletter you can um, you can uh, subscribe to. Okay, so um, this was an overview of the requirements for open access to publications, and now I'm going to give um, an an overview of the requirements for research data. So. In terms of the mandate, you have to manage, um, and again, everything I'm going, all those keywords I'm going to mention, I will explain them um, in in, 
in future slides. So you must manage basically uh, all your data following what we call the FAIR principles. So it's uh, the FAIR principles are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. You need to create a data management plan by month six, which you will update during the, the project and before the end of the project. You must deposit all the, at least the metadata, but uh, hopefully the data uh, itself as soon as possible after it's been produced um, <clears throat> or after it has gone any quality controls. It doesn't need to be open, but you need to at least deposit it. And you need to deposit it in a trusted repository um, and follow the, the rule of um, opening as open as possible, as close as necessary. Um, so as I said, the data can be closed, uh, but the met metadata, so metadata uh, is any um, data that uh, explains what the data it, it is. So the authors, the, the title, um, any um, um, persistent identifiers that link to, to the data, all this is what describes the, the data and is what we call the, the metadata. Um, you also have to share the uh, the data under either a CC BY, but preferentially under a CC0 license. Again, I will explain in, in, a, in a future slide what those are, the difference. Um, and as I said before, um, strong emphasis on providing detailed information about research outputs to validate uh, the, the and reuse the, the data. They are Obviously, and this is very uh, clear from the documentation from the European Commission, that uh, intellectual property rights is really important for the European Commission. So they are valid justification for not opening the, the data. So commercially valuable data, for instance, um, does not have to be open. You can make it closed um, so that you can exploit basically the, the, the results. Obviously, if there's any uh, data privacy, data protection, rules of you know sensitive uh, data, personal data under GDPR, then obviously you wouldn't be um, uh, opening that up. Um, there are a few exceptions in terms of uh, the opening the data. Uh, if it needs for validation, you might need to open it to specific individuals. Um, and in, in, in case of public emergencies, and that was um, created uh, or added to the policy uh, because of COVID-19, um, you it can be triggered by the European Commission and you would need to provide um, immediate open access basically to um, not just the publication, but also to, to, the, to the data. Um, again, they, they might be some uh, conflict with uh, intellectual property rights, and uh, this has to be uh, discussed directly with the, the project officer in, in general. So, as I mentioned um, before, I'm going to uh, describe a, a few things uh, that I had uh, mentioned before, a few definitions. So uh, this is the same slide as for the um, publications. The trusted repository is basically the same definition. Um, so use one that is well endorsed in your community or use a generic one like Zenodo. Uh, for research data, there's a specific uh, website where you can look for different repositories called Re3 Data. Um, or you can just go on OpenAI Explore. It has all the different repositories uh, available. So in terms of licenses, I mentioned for publication, it has to be under Creative Commons attribution license, a CC BY license. Um, and for data, it's preferentially a CC zero. So Creative Commons is, is an actual uh, license. So it's a, it's a legal binding uh, um, uh, li license, basically, that um, um, the CC BY at least, uh, it, it avoids any confusion basically of what you can or cannot do with the data or the publication. Um, so under CC BY, you have to basically say 
include uh, the authors were and in which context. So for instance, this, all those uh, slides here, you can see in the bottom right is under a CC BY license, meaning that you can reuse as you want, you can modify it um, as long as you credit um, the, uh, the origin. A CC0 is a bit different and I won't go really into details of why uh, it's preferred for data, but CC0 is basically you can share uh, dApps um, without having to um, attribute the, the authors. Um, so it's quite similar to public domain type of, um, of a license. So I mentioned a data management plan. Um, it's a beast in itself. I can't cover it in what uh, goes uh, uh, into detail, but data management plan, if uh, you haven't heard of it, is a formal, what we call a living document because you will be updating it every time there's any uh, modifications. It basically says how the research data during and after the project will be handled. Um, so during the project, how are you going to share with other partners the, the data? Uh, after the project, what are you going to do with the data? How are you going to, to share it with, uh, with the world? The issue with a data management plan is that there's no absolute right or wrong answers. Um, as long as you justify uh, why you made this, uh, this decision, um, it's in theory, um, okay. It's just that you have to prove to the project officer basically that you know what you're doing with uh, with your your project. Um, in terms of the fair principles, I mentioned those again. Again, it's um, it's a, too short of a webinar to be able to go into details. Um, but basically, there are a few different concepts around. So, for instance, having um, your data always needs to have what we call a persistent identifier. So it's like a, a DOI. So for instance, if you deposit on Zenodo, it will give you this URL that always, uh, there's no, never any broken links with a persistent identifier. Um, it needs to be deposited on a trusted repository. It needs to be well-documented. So have a readme file, has a clear license, um, use open, um, file formats if possible, or well-used file formats. All this type of um, aspects are, um, form what we call the, the FAIR principles. But again, if you're not familiar with them, you will need to, to look uh, a bit more into it to get familiar with, uh, with it and to be able to also fill in the, the DMP. And um, you also need to provide, uh, so all the um, articles needs to, to include the data availability uh, statement. Um, even if there's no data associated with the article, you still need to, to, uh, to provide uh, that. So uh, a couple of useful tools uh, that might interest you. I mentioned it already, Open Air Explore. Um, it's, you can search for publication research data uh, to repositories. Um, it has, uh, it's basically an aggregator of all the different types of um, information that exists, whether it's publication data, software, grants, organization. It's used by the European Commission. The, 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 Research graph that is behind it is used by the European Commission to make sure that you are compliant also with your, your uh, data and publication, uh, uh, the, the data and, and publication requirements. Amnesia is for um, uh, compliance with uh, GDPR, basically, so where you're going to anonymize the, the personal data for sensitive data and uh, it's a useful tool so that you basically don't have to uh, to fall under GDPR because um, uh, the, 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 the data is, becomes anonymous. Argos is a, a, a tool to write data management plans. It's free, it's open source. Um, it's, uh, you can create different versions of it, so you can update it throughout the, the life of the, the project, um, and you can even publish it uh, on, on Zenodo. Um, 
and it has the uh, New Horizon Europe uh, DMP template already embedded in it. And there are some community calls if you want to participate in, in those. Okay, so I've mentioned up to now the um, the requirements, um, and now I'm going to, it's a bit more at towards the end or during the, um, uh, it's the reporting basically and the monitoring of those uh, of those um, elements of open science uh, requirements. So um, you will always have the uh, the project officers and the reviewers that will be monitoring uh, compliance around the open science um, the open science mandates, um, and you you need to um, report basically in an instructed way. On the portal, what's your um, the, your achievements basically? So, in terms of the uh, continuous reporting, you have uh, different. Probably familiar with the, the the portal, you have different tabs that are relevant to open science. The publications uh, is basically for publications, and uh, you can import automatically. It will suggest based on. So, for instance, if you were to <clears throat> Uh, upload it on on uh, Zenodo. Um, you will link it to the project, and then it will automatically appear on on the portal, and you can accept it as part of the the project or not. So it will already be pre-filled for for you. That's why it's important to deposit on the trusted repository because it makes also your reporting um, easier. Um, they are. Um, I'm not going to go into details of this, but um, because you'll have the, the slides, um, but there is a few um, fields that you need to, to make sure that are that are correct. In terms of data sets, it's the same. It will, if you deposit it on a trusted repository, such as the Nodo, it will appear in the, the suggested um, data set and you can just accept them. Um, the same way we did um, with uh, the publications. There's also the results and other results um, the tabs, which can be slightly confusing because of the, the names. So the results <clears throat> focuses on the any discovery series, products, services, methods that you come up with uh, as part of the project. Whereas um, other results is about reporting other type of uh, resources like softwares, protocols, prototypes, workflows. Um, um, so yes, it's um, it might be a bit confusing at, at the beginning, but um, I think after the, there's um, it's well explained on on the portal. <clears throat> so up to now, I've um, explained, I've covered uh, basically once you've already have a, a, a grant with Horizon Europe, what your requirements are. And we're going to take a step back um, because I also wanted to, to give an overview of during the grant proposal, what are the open science elements that you need to, to cover. Um, again, this is um, a slide so that you get an overview of uh, which parts of are uh, relevant to to open science? Um, so in part A, so the application form, you have to list um, uh, publication data sets that are relevant that your publications are, are relevant to to the call. And in part B, um, so the actual project proposal, you have to under excellence, uh, impact, and quality and efficiency of the implementation you have some um, elements to mention around um, open science. <clears throat> In terms of um, publications, um, the so part A, you always want to be, um, the publication you cite have to be available in open access, meaning that they have to be on a trusted repository openly available. Uh, if you share, if you cite uh, one of your publications that is not in open access, it won't be considered as uh, um, valid for the grant proposal. Um, one thing important, because you probably know that the, um, the commission doesn't um, evaluate 
uh, researchers and the researcher assessment isn't done on uh, on impact factor uh, anymore. So they, they is, um, the, the impact factor of the journal that you mentioned is not relevant. It's the actual quality of the content inside the uh, the paper that will be. Um, and you can also give some uh, insights in where you, you want to, to publish, including the, the commission's platform, Open Research Europe. In terms of <clears throat> research data, it's the same. The data you list needs to be uh, fair uh, and so openly available if, if possible. Um, an official data management plan is not needed at this step, but they will ask you very similar questions to it. So in a way, you're doing like a, a mini DMP inside the, the, the grant proposal. So you already need to start thinking about it. And there's a distinct work package uh, on project management uh, that must include the DMP as a deliverable. Um, and as I said before, it's by month six. Um, in the budget, don't forget that uh, you, you the article processing charges, uh, the open access fees for full open access journals are eligible, so you should include those. Any <clears throat> help with data curation costs can also be included, and you should definitely think about who and how you're going to manage the, the data. That's also why it's important to have that in the um, to to think about this mini DMP when you're submitting the proposal, and anything related to uh, engagement of citizens um, um, will add um, basically like um, um, bonus points to to your applications, and you can uh, um, include them in in the budget. Um, so. Just a couple of tips I can give in terms of uh, the grant proposal, in terms of the open science, is to be as specific as, as possible. Um, so you, you don't want people, the reviewers, to, to try and uh, find the information of what you will do with the data. And you, you want basically to, uh, to prove to the, the, the commission that you know what you're doing and that um, um, what will be done in, in the, the uh, in the proposal. Um, there's a few uh, special cases, so the ERC and Marie Curie uh, fellowships. So in the ERC, there's no explicit um, evaluation or requirements for the open science, but it will always have a positive impact if you include them. Um, and it doesn't have a specific work package um, um, but it does have, um, it does require a DMP. And for the Marie Curie actions, uh, it is open science is quite a big, uh, important aspect. Um, it will be considered in under the excellence criteria, um, and um, and it also needs to include any training activity and career development. Um, that has a focus on open science um, for it to, to be uh, scored better. So there's a big focus on open science in, in, in those calls. So I mentioned until now um, the, the requirements, but there's also a lot of other different types of open science um, practices because open science is an umbrella term. Um, so I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to leave the slides for you if you're interested. And uh, basically, while the mandatory open science practices um, are required, so you will your score will be lower if you don't address them, the recommended open science practices um, don't have a negative impact. Uh, they will only have a positive impact if you include them. So if you include citizen science, for instance, uh, that will be a positive. But if you decide not to do citizen science, it won't have a negative impact. Um, so yes, there's a lot of uh, different elements to it. Um, Pre-registration is um, basically where you will uh, publish uh, the plan of a study. 
uh, so the research question, hypothesis, research days, design, um, how you're planning on analyzing the data before you even start doing the uh, the, um, the research. Um, so pre-registration, if you're planning on doing that, I would highly uh, recommend um, adding it inside the grant proposal to show that you're really trying to make um, your your research as open, transparent as possible. Um, Preprints is, as I mentioned before, uh, the version when you uh, before peer reviewing. So Open Research Europe is an uh, open peer review process. So it doesn't really have a preprint, it's immediately available. Um, but there are some uh, preprints uh, servers that you can uh, use to, so archive for for physics uh, is um, the, the most um, uh, known one, but there's now a lot of different uh, ones that you can use. Um, and yes, I would always recommend sharing your work as soon as possible, uh, even before peer, uh, peer reviewing. Um, yes, so then there's public engagement that can be done in many different uh, ways. And uh, if you are going to do public engagement, really think about um, demonstrating in the grant proposal what you're planning on on, on doing that will um, improve the your you will get a better score and citizen science so involving directly um, citizens in your research project um, is also something that will grant you something that the commit commission European Commission does uh, um, really favor so if that fits your your project, then uh, again, I would recommend trying to include that. So just to conclude on uh, this presentation, and before we ask for uh, the open the floor for Q and A, um, I want to emphasize that it's I know it's a lot of things around open science because um, as part of a, a grant, you already have a lot of things to think about not just the open science. Um, so I would really recommend from the, the start to design an open science strategy. So not just create a, a DMP or, you know, but really have a plan in terms of how you want um, to all those different requirements, all those different um, optional um, recommended practices to fit in your, in your project. Um, and yes, be as specific as possible in um, in the grant proposal. Uh, during the project, uh, implement it. So don't uh, don't write the 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 DMP uh, two days before the the, the deliverable is due, because it takes time. So I would recommend starting from month one, because it does take uh, time to to do and to review. Um, yeah, and and make sure to report everything you you do. Um, and as I said, for the DMP, for instance, it's a living document. So if there's any issues um, coming up, it's okay to change it. It's okay to you know change strategy during the the, the project. Uh, nothing is uh, set in stone. Um, so yes, please um, keep track of those issues and and uh, continue moving forward. Um, yeah, so we run this uh, this webinar three times a year. The, the date for the next one is already uh, up there. And um, on this, I'd like to thank all of you. And I'll have a look at the the Q and A now. So. Okay, so I have a question. Um, most leading journals in our field impose embargo periods for self-archiving postprints. So we are forced either to pay a fortune in every more expensive APCs or not to publish in this journal. It is correct. Is there any way out? Yes, so embargo periods, uh, the difference, big difference between Horizon 2020 
uh, is that embargo punitives are not allowed. So yes, in the past, it was allowed uh, by the European Commission, so six months for or 12 months. Um, now that's not, um, that's not uh, possible. So yes, you are required to, if the, 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 um, the publisher doesn't allow you to use the rights retention strategy, then yes, you do have to, to pay for uh, APCs. But again, you would have to find that money elsewhere because hybrid journals would not be, uh, be covered. Um, but I would really try and um, go for trying to include the rights retention strategy, this, uh, this statement when you send it. So even if the, the publisher might not appear to want to, you can still try and then they will tell you, no, we, we don't accept the, the rights retention uh, uh, strategy uh, statement. Um, so yes, unfortunately, if you can't pay for hybrid in another way, or if they don't accept the, the rights retention strategy, then you do have to find a, a different uh, venue for, for publishing. Um, articles uploaded in academia or ResearchGate considered archived. Yes, so um, I should have mentioned that. No, the, 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 the straight answer is no. The academia and ResearchGate are um, social websites but they don't fit in the definition of a trusted repository. So they are useful as for, for you as researchers, um, but, um, and you can share them there, but, um, but no, they're not trusted repositories. You need to find one that, um, that is specific uh, to your field or a genetic one like the node. Um, what about archive? Apparently it does not fulfill all metadata requirements the EU now has with Horizon Europe. Okay, so um, if you look at the um, pure definition of the Horizon Europe, uh, what is considered a trusted repository, there's, I think, up to now only three trusted repositories uh, in the world. So the commission, maybe I shouldn't say that uh, <laughs> webinar, but the commission sometimes does things that uh, like sets things that is a bit too much in advance, even if it doesn't exist yet. So my view on on it, and I don't think it's uh, an issue from up to now, it hasn't been an issue uh, brought up by the commission is, Trusted repositories is this loose definition of an, a repository that at least has a minimum set of uh, criteria, like having a persistent identifier, like a, a DOI, um, and uh, and has metadata and, and all this that is endorsed in your community. So as as long as it's uh, robust, um, then it it is considered as um, um, as a, as valid for, for publishing. The one thing I do want to, to mention is Archive is a preprint server. So you can upload your, uh, your work as a preprint, then have it published and then uh, change the, the version that is on there from the preprint to the author accepted manuscript that would um, make Archive as a trusted repository. But if I'm not mistaken, and may, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I don't think that's the case, you cannot uh, upload an, an actual um, uh, paper on archive. It's a preprint server. It's before peer reviewing that has the option to update it with the uh, uh, peer reviewed uh, version. Um, but yes, so far um, in terms of like the, the pure uh, definitions of um, the EU in terms of uh, trusted repositories, um, I would say archive is still considered as a trusted re repository. Um, Horizon Europe project reimburse only publication in fully open access journals. What about books? Should the open access book be published by a publisher that publishes 100% open access? Or could the publisher of the open access book be hybrid? So again, um, any publication that is peer reviewed, 
uh, falls under the open access mandates. So a book, uh, so a long tank format, a monograph, um, would also have to be uh, made full up, uh, made available in open access. But uh, it doesn't have to be the final version that is in open access. It's the same as with articles. So the on the publisher's website, for instance, the books you could be um, uh, you have to pay for it. But on the trusted repository, the let's say what I call the ugly version of your your manuscript, the the, the non-edited version would be uh, openly available. So you need to at least have that version. Um, one thing to that I mentioned is that the it doesn't have to be under Creative Commons attribution license. It can be more restri uh, restricted. Um, but books also have to be open access. And in the same thing with article, you, if it's full open access, a uh, full open access uh, book publisher, it is absolutely um, 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 compatible with um, with the grant. So you can uh, you can ask for um, for the grant to cover those uh, those costs. Um, Okay, apparently there's a problem with the, the DOI. I'll let Athena answer on this. Shouldn't have, but okay. Um, could you oops. could you discuss Creative Commons licenses with currently listed CC BY? Um, however, we'd like to know what other um, personal identifiers have used in the past and why. There's a tool on the Creative Commons website to help figure out which license might be best, but we want to make sure we're complying with open science while maintaining certain rights. Um, I can't really answer this question without knowing exactly what you're referring to. It will depend on what, um, what you're licensing. So if it's a publication, it has to be CC BY. There's uh, that's the the rule. If it's data, it has to be CC BY or CC zero, or something equivalent. Uh, if it's software, uh, it's not mandatory, but um, it is uh, recommended by the European Commission, and uh, it is recommended to do an open license. Um, so it really depends on on um, on the type of um, elements that you want to be uh, publishing. So if, yeah, if it's if it's data, it's more CC zero. If it's publication, it's uh, CC by. Um, there are other open licenses, but in my experience, the Creative Commons licenses are the easiest to implement. So I don't see really the the point of um, trying to use another one since this one is widely um, available. Um, if it's software, it's 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 a bit different. Um, why is it important that the EMP is required by month six? Um, that's just the rule that the European Commission has set. Um, the reason why the European Commission does that is to make sure that you know what you're doing uh, with the data. So if uh, so, if a very uh, stupid example is uh, if you're managing personal data, and you need to within the consortium you need to share it with uh, different um, partners, and especially if those partners are located outside of the EU, then how are you practically um, sharing that uh, that data? Uh, what tool are you using? What platform is the platform secure? Uh, are there any um, the security protocols are in place to ensure that there's no data leaks I and mean, these kind of things? These are things that you need to think about, and you need to put them in the in the DMP to make sure that you have thought of them. And that's what the Commission wants: is to make sure that um, you know what you're doing, but they want to make sure that you know what you're you're doing. And also because a lot of the time it's something that we might think about, but we might not um, 
concretely write it down. So people might be using different file naming conventions and it's to, it's to avoid any um, confusions as to um, how to organize your folders, organize your, your, your files within the, the consortium. Uh, are there any numbers or percentage on how well the rights retention strategy is received? Uh, image in most journals will just reject a paper if the uh, it is mentioned. Um, I don't have an actual figure. My feeling is that yes, it's still something that is, let's say, optimistic. Um, although I have had experiences where researchers, I, I think one of the elements is that researchers are don't feel in in power. So they feel like the power falls completely in the hands of the 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 publisher, which is not true in, in reality. You have a lot of power because if you all decided to tell the publisher, no, that's how we want it, you could definitely do it. We've seen examples of, of that. Um, I've had experiences where uh, I've um, recommended to authors to send a message to the publisher and the publisher did accept. Um, so it really depends on the actual um, uh, publisher. We know that some publishers are a bit more um, conservative, let, let's say, but the general checker tool will, will help you um, uh, check if it, check on, on that. Uh, is ERC eligible to publish in Open Research Europe? Yes, definitely. Anyone that it falls under Horizon Europe. Um, it's specific branch, but it, it still falls under Horizon Europe. So yes. Uh, could it be possible to have the aspect that differentiate self-archiving from publishing? So publishing is when you do the actual peer reviewing process and it will be available, uh, if we talk about the traditional publisher, it will be available in open access, for instance, on the publisher's website. The issue with uh, that is that if one day, let's say the, the publisher um, goes bankrupt, uh, the website won't be maintained. And so the link will just die. The self-archiving, the, the point behind it is to deposit it on a repository which has the role of uh, long-term preservation of research. So the biggest difference is this long-term preservation of your work to make sure that it is available um, for anyone to read for free in in the future. Um, so that's the, the, the difference is publishing is from the publisher's website and self-archiving is you doing it um, and depositing a version on, on, a, on a repository. Um, what about publication in different, less scientific outlets, newspaper or the conversation can we do, or do we have to deposit them in trusted repositories? So if they are, uh, maybe I should, for next time I should emphasize on that, it's only peer reviewed uh, the, the mandate only falls on the peer-reviewed um, uh, articles. So if it's not peer-reviewed, you don't have to do it. It's not required. But it is recommended by the European Commission. And I personally also would recommend it, uh, uploading it on a trusted repository such as Zenodo, because it will provide you with uh, this DOI, this um, persistent identifier, the mean, meaning that it will never, the link will never break, um, which can make it easier to, to share because sometimes um, articles in newspaper, for instance, might not be um, widely available. So it can be also a way of sharing with the greater public uh, what you, you've done. And it's also important as one of those um, uh, other types of resources of outputs that you did for the project that doesn't fall in the traditional way of um, uh, of publication or, or data. Uh, can we deposit the author accepting manuscript in more than one repository as another and the institution? Um, yes, absolutely. 
it might be redundant uh, because from a, you might want to deposit in only one repository because you want the more, let's say, traffic to it, the more downloads from one place um, to make sure to, to see really in, in one place the, the impact your, your, your work has. Um, but yes, when I was working at a previous um, university, I would upload it on both um, the institution and on Zenodo. That was a personal uh, choice um, because there was an institutional mandate also. Um, so yes, that's absolutely fine. It's just a strategy you think you need to think about whether it's the best strategy or not uh, in terms of um, um, yes, traffic to, to your downloads and views to your to your work. So for publication, if they are not peer reviewed, they don't have to be deposited in a trusted repository and they don't have to be reported. Yes, as I mentioned, you don't have to deposit them on a repository, but there's no there's no point not reporting them because that's a really important the, the the commission doesn't value just the publication and the data they value other type of outputs um so this is not fully open science it's more of uh, dissemination and, and outreach um but the com commission is definitely interested in in all the different outputs that you you do during the the project so even if it's not mandated, it's definitely something positive for, for you for, as part of the project to, to do. So I would still highly recommend doing it. How shall we proceed if the data collected do not completely belong to the researcher, the communication of objects in museums? Here, usually the data can be used for research, but not shared with others without specific permission of the museum. And as the researchers, we have no leverage over this. Yes, so as the commission mentions, it's as open as possible, as close as necessary. There might be some elements that are not in your control. If, for instance, you work with a private company, um, they might not allow you to, um, to provide everything in openly. Um, this is another case where you can't, uh, you might not have the specific permission. Again, that's perfectly all right. You just need to uh, inform in the DMP, for instance, why you won't be able to open specific data to the public. And you just explain, these are my situation, the museum doesn't allow me. And then that's okay. There, there's no right or wrong answer as long as you justify everything. So um, if it was a different um, case where you you were saying, I don't want to share because X said, but then the project officer might say, well, I disagree with this. Um, I think there's still room for you to open it. But in this specific case, no, it's from a, uh, another um, member in your, um, it, yeah, you, you don't have to if you, you're not required to if you if you can't uh, um, if you don't have the the permission. Um, will there be another webinar on scientific reporting? So far, it's not planned by by Open Air. No. Um, how exactly will the content be evaluated? Is there an overview of what sorts of aspects are seen? the qualitative and when those aspects are met. This highly depends on the reviewers and the project officer. There's no right and wrong answer. You probably know <clears throat> um, well if you have um, been funded by uh, under um, the European Commission that it really varies from reviewer to reviewer and from project officer to project officer. There some will be much more involved and others will be much more um, do what you want. So it really depends on on the actual uh, people rather than the um, uh, the specific um, set of qualitative um, questions. 
And some journals offer the possibility to buy the open access for a fee. And these fees eligible for funding. So this is the difference between full open access and hybrid journals. If the journal only allows full open access, so you have to pay whatever, you know, you have to pay a fee, then yes, that is eligible. If it's a um, traditional um, subs subscription-based journal where you don't have to pay for open access, but if you do, they will um, make it open access, then those costs are not eligible. Um, considering only open access publications in proposal may be very prohibitive in certain areas of research, what should people do when the major journal in the field are not open access? So remember that um, in the grant proposal, we are talking about publications that have been published so the, the mandate of immediate open access is not um, in place. We are talking about is open, is available in open access, meaning that for a lot of um, uh, publishers, there's an embargo period and that can vary between 12 and 24 months. Um, so if your work is not available on a repository in open access, you can check um, that uh, that you can open it up and then just add it to your repository um, uh, in, in open access. So there's a difference between the requirements during your project, which have to be a very specific set of, um, of um, sets of license and um, immediate open access and what is for the grant proposal which they just means that you they want you to provide an um, an open access version to to your work um in a dmp should we deal only with open research data or is it more general any type of data used or created by the project such as deliverable, creative software, minutes of meeting. Um, it's research data in general. So minutes of a meeting is not considered as research data, um, but software definitely is a type of output. It's not necessarily just data, but any other type of outputs could be um, um, added. Um, because when you create a software, you have specific files uh, uh, that are created. And so you want to mention, OK, we are going to create whatever type of uh, files we are creating in, in the project. And we're going to store them here. And this is what we're going to do. So minutes of a meeting is not research data in itself. So it doesn't have to be added. But anything that is um, part of the research output, like official research outputs of the project should be included in, in the DMP. When should the, be the data published at the latest publication date of an article? So the metadata needs to be provided as soon as is, the data is generated. So much before the publication date. The data itself should be made open as soon as possible, meaning it could be before the publication date. But obviously, you might not want to do that because you want to make sure that the publication is there first. So because sometimes people might um, be um, afraid of uh, scooping and this kind of uh, other groups, you know, analyzing the data and publishing um, before them. So that's a perfect valid uh, reason to um, put in, let's say, embargo on opening the data. But the actual metadata, so the, the to to make the world um, aware that the data is exists, basically, that has to be as soon as possible. Um, do you need informed consent from participants to place the data in a control repository? 
yeah, that's that's ethics and informed consents and GDPR. So all those types of rules always um, always apply. Um, if you're dealing with sensitive data, um, so I see genetic sequence data and this kind of things, uh, there's an extra step, I would say, of making sure that the data is um, secure. Um, so as with everything, if uh, you're during your grant or, or before when you're writing, I would uh, go with the data protection officer, sit down and make sure that uh, you've considered all the uh, the venues for GDPR compliance. Um, a lot of the uh, organization universities have a chief information security officer also that um, deal more with the IT aspects. Um, so definitely contact those people to, to make sure that your, um, your infrastructure, the IT infrastructure is the best as possible to protect the, 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 the data. Um, I think. To double check embargo is a lot in Horizon Europe, but not H2020. No, it's the reverse. So H2020 was before, now we're in Horizon Europe. In H2020, we could, uh, you were allowed six months for um, uh, STEM sciences and, uh, and 12 months for social uh, sciences and humanities under Horizon Europe. So the current calls, uh, it needs to be immediate open access. And just checking that the okay. Yes, yeah, so there's uh, another uh, comment. The problem here is the scientists are sitting between a rock and a hard place. Articles are necessary to advance one's career and get grants and be good, widely recognized. Publishers usually have more articles submitted than they can publish. Um, yeah, there's, I am not, it, I understand the frustration. I'm here presenting the uh, the, the requirements set by the, the European Commission. There are really strong reasons why the European Commission uh, does it like this, because without any change, it it just research would not go forward. It would be um, it published. It would still be very uh, opaque about. Um, and we we saw it really well during the pandemic when there was a real need for opening the uh, the research to to advance on uh, on um, vaccines and and all that. Um, I understand the the frustration because it is a very difficult um situation to be in because for your career you do need to kind of follow the rules that were like the previous rule but at the same time you're in a transition period where hopefully in the future it will uh, the research assessments will and it's already changing but the research assessment will be uh, more widely accepted as not based on just the impact factor and the way it's been done uh, in the last 20 uh, 30 years but in a more um in a more transparent, uh, transparent and ethical way. Um, so I can completely understand the, the frustration, and it's something that is um, difficult to to deal with. Um, but um, but yes, unfortunately, that's the current. You're in a transition period, so it's it's always the the hardest, but hopefully we're going in the, in the right uh, direction. Okay, so there's a, another final comment about, question about open access book. Would the cost for an open access book be eligible if the book, plug, book publisher is hybrid and publishes all the books that are not 100% open access? for the cost to be available, they should be publishing only open access books. Yeah, so 
it's the same as for journal articles. If it's a hybrid publisher, then you cannot cover the uh, um, the uh, the book processing charges under the under the grant. You would need to find another way. But again. You don't need to publish it in open access. If the publisher allows you to retain your rights on the author accepted manuscripts and um, so apply a CC BY license to that and then upload that to a, a repository, then you are compliant. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I hope this was useful. Um, the, you can always uh, ask more questions uh, to the help desk at openair.eu and uh, I'm behind, I'm the one answering those uh, emails anyway. Um, so yes, if you have any more questions, don't hesitate sending us an uh, uh, email and on this, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining everyone. Um... As Jonathan said, uh, you can always reach out to us uh, if you need to. And we hope to see you at the next one. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye.